Good morning, friends, and welcome again to Sabbath School Study Hour. Coming to you here from the Granite Bay Seventh day Adventist Church in Sacramento, California. Very warm welcome to our online members and those who are joining us across the country and around the world, part of our study Sabbath School group this morning. Also, I'd like to welcome the regular members and visitors right here at the Granite Bay Church. Over the past few weeks, we've been studying through a lesson courtly on stewardship. It's entitled Stewardship Motors of the Heart. It's been an excellent study so far. It's actually been convicting on a number of those topics that were brought to view in our study together. Today we find ourselves on lesson number six, and it's entitled, The Marks of a Steward. Lesson number six, The Marks of a Steward. For those who are joining us, if you don't have a copy of lesson number six and would like to study along with us, you can download the lesson at the Amazing Facts website, just amazingfacts.org. Click on the link that says Sabbath School Study Hour, and you can download lesson number six, The Marks of a Steward, and that's what we're going to be studying today. We also have a free offer that goes along with the subject that we're looking at. It's an amazing fact study guide entitled In God We Trust, and this is our free offer for this morning. If you'd like to receive this anywhere in North America, give us a call on our resource phone line. That number is 866 788 3966. If you're outside of North America, you can read the study guide at the Amazing Facts website, just amazingfacts.org. Well, before we get to our study this morning, we like to begin by lifting our voices in song. I'd like to invite our song leaders to come join me. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity once again to come and open up your word and study this very important subject of being a faithful steward to you for all of the blessings and all of the many things that you have entrusted to our care. Help us to use our talents, our abilities wisely for the furtherance of your kingdom. Bless our time today, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our lesson this morning is going to be brought to us by Dr. David DeRose. Thank you. Well, we're continuing on our journey studying through stewardship, motives of the heart. And as uh, Pastor Jean mentioned not long ago, lesson six is our focus today, the marks of a steward. The marks of a steward. Perhaps you've thought about it, 
Maybe you hadn't lately, but it continues to bombard us in the media. And it's simply how the actions of a single person or a few people can totally damage a brand. Have you thought about it? A few airline employees treat someone unkindly on a plane, and what happens to the brand of that airline? A few engineers tinker with the exhaust system of a vehicle and uh, end up trashing the brand that is represented by thousands of people throughout the world. Are you following along? But it doesn't have to be something abstract that maybe doesn't directly impact you. Maybe it was just that last phone call to the big retailer that you deal with, perhaps an online retailer, and you make that call and you get someone on the other end of the line who is totally insensitive, maybe even rude, that's right. What does that do to the brand of that company? Well, this morning, our lesson study brings the concept of brand into focus. As we begin this study on the marks of a steward, we have a scripture reading, a memory text, that actually crystallizes a lot of what today's lesson is about. This week's lesson, The Marks of a Steward, 1 Corinthians 4 is where the scripture is found, verses 1 and 2, and feel free to read that with me in the New King James Version, 1 Corinthians 4, verses 1 and 2. Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. Well, as the lesson opens up, it says, stewards are known by their brand or their distinctive mark. Think about it. What are Christians known for? You might say, well, Christians are known for good things. We're Christians after all. We're here worshiping in God's house. But in many people's minds, Christianity is not associated with good things. Are there places in the world where someone labeled a Christian is identified with immorality? You following along with me? There are. There are places in the world where people that take the name of Jesus Christ are identified with those who do not dress morally, do not watch things that are moral, do not live moral lives. Are you following along with me? How is it with our representation of Jesus? How is it with my representation? That scripture, 1 Corinthians 4, is embedded in a context, and we want to spend a little time looking at the context of 1 Corinthians. I don't know what kind of churches you've been members of, and here we're in the Granite Bay Church. I'm thankful to be a member of this congregation. Not every church, though, has a, uh, well, desirable pedigree, if you will. If you turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians, where our memory text came from, we're reading about a, a church, we're reading a letter that Paul wrote to a church that is not a church that had an enviable reputation, at least at the time Paul was writing his letter. In fact, things were so bad in the Corinthian church that by the time Paul gets to chapter 5 of 1 Corinthians, and I'm paraphrasing, chapter 5 opens up where Paul is saying, things so bad are happening in your church that not even the non-Christians would think of doing anything like this. It's interesting to me, though, that 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians really give us some of the clearest insight into what it takes to be an effective steward. And it, it actually is crystallized in a number of descriptions of the calling that we have as believers. Let's look together at, first of all, a very key scripture that actually comes from 1 Corinthians right before 
that low point, if you will, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm going to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. A very short verse, but one that uh, really behooves us to, to uh, really imbibe, to really take in. There Paul writes, 1 Corinthians 4, 16, Therefore I urge you, imitate me. Paul is urging believers to do what? To imitate him. Paul is basically saying that Jesus is calling him to be an example of believers. Now you might say, well, that's good for Paul, but what about for you and me? Paul's example as he writes the letters to the Corinthian church, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, is actually revealing his own heart and our calling as believers. Let's look at some of the descriptions here. And the reason we're doing it is because I don't want us to fall in the trap. As important as it is to understand the call to being stewards, the Bible calls us other things as well that take in a fuller idea of stewardship. In fact, a fuller idea, an idea that we might miss were we just to think about what a steward does, and we are going to look at that in detail. So let's look a little bit more at some of the descriptions of Paul's own calling and the calling of believers. Remember, we're looking at Paul's calling for two reasons. We're to do what? We just read in 1 Corinthians 4, 16. We're to imitate Paul. So Paul's calling is my calling as well. It's your calling as well, because Paul, under divine inspiration, was saying God was leading in his life so that we would imitate, that we would catch in him a picture of Jesus. Isn't that what it's all about? It's not about Paul, it's not about you or me, it's reflecting the master. Let's see that, let's see how that picks up. I'm going back to 1 Corinthians 3 now. We're just looking at a few other descriptors that help us have a better understanding of our calling and they all tie in ultimately with stewardship. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse five. Let's look at this. Who then is Paul and who is Apollos but ministers through whom you believed as the Lord gave to each one? So what is Paul calling himself in this verse? A minister. So what does a minister do? Yeah, you say ministers. I mean, what a silly question. But what does it mean to minister to someone? to be a spiritual leader, to teach some of these ideas come to you. Let me ask you this question, and don't all raise your hands or don't all shout out at once, but has anyone ministered to you since you walked through the doors of the church this morning? I mean, how do, and I see some of you nodding your heads, smiling. How does someone minister to you? Did they teach, did they preach to you as you walked in? They prayed with you, they loved you. Someone was friendly to you. So basically, we're seeing that one characteristic of this calling, and really, it takes in, it takes in stewardship because we're being entrusted as stewards, ones who, ta who cares for the master's goods, for the master's work, if you will, in the eyes of the lesson, the master's brand. Let's look at another descriptor. Verse 9 in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Paul says here, For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, you are God's building. Well, now here's some other interesting imagery, isn't it? Now we're what? Fellow workers. Now what does that imply? Well, yeah, workers imply we have some kind of a job, we have a work to do, but what does that idea of fellow workers imply? Yeah, we're working side by side. In fact, as you read the opening of 1 Corinthians, what was agonizing Paul's heart was that there was disunity in the church. There were factions in the church, okay? This was the report that came back to Paul and the immorality in the church. So the church were not being good stewards of the message that God has entrusted. So as Paul's writing this letter, we see all this imagery of what he's called us to be. We're called to be God's building, his church, his body, his members. All these things come out in 1st and 2nd Corinthians. Let's look at just a few others here. Um, chapter four began with this imagery of stewards and servants. But as you slip down to verse 9, we catch another glimpse. 
1 Corinthians 4, verse 9, For I think that God has displayed us the apostles last, as men condemned to death. For we have been made a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. We are, if you will, actors on a stage. Not not, uh, playing a role that really isn't who we are, but actually the world is looking on at the Christian church. The world is looking at you and me. They're judging Jesus by us. I mean, it's a sobering, sobering thought, isn't it? Some time ago, I met a woman. We'll call her Lois. And uh, Lois was telling me with her contact with the Christian church. They actually happened to be the Seventh-day Adventist church. It could have just as well, you could say, have been the Baptist church or Assemblies of God. But think about it. What do people think when they hear Christian or Adventist or any denomination? What do they hear? Well, Lois had a unique perspective on the local Seventh-day Adventist church because it happened to be right across the street from her. So she and her husband didn't see what was happening in the church. They had never walked into the church. They just saw what was happening in the church parking lot. So what would someone see if they were looking at the Granite Bay Church parking lot? Or for those of you that join us from around the world, what would they see looking at your church from a distance at the parking lot? What happens in the parking lot? Are there warm greetings? Are there angry words spoken? Is someone uh, giving dirty looks to someone because they pulled in their parking spot? By the way, I'm not speaking about anything that I know of happening here at Granite Bay. I'm just thinking of the scenario that could be played out in many churches. And so Lois and her husband are looking at that local Seventh-day Adventist church. Now, how many of you are a little bit on the edge of your seat wondering what they saw? I mean, I hear stories like this. I'm thinking, I mean, you know, what's going to happen? I mean, what is, what is this woman going to see? She said, she and her husband said, these look like the happiest people on earth. She said, we have to find out why they're so happy. When I met Lois, she was a Seventh-day Adventist. She and her husband had been won to the church because of what? The stewardship of members. They, they, were, they were entrusted with this responsibility of carrying on the Lord's work. And it wasn't just something they, they put on when they walked through the doors of the church. It apparently was happening every time they at least drove into the church parking lot. And, ho- and if it happened every time they drove in the church parking lot, you can be pretty sure it was happening at home too. Wouldn't it be good if we all had churches like the one that Lois looked at that just drew people in? Because even if they never walked through the doors of the church, they would say, if those people are like that, I want to find out what makes them click. Well, a few other glimpses of stewards, a few other glimpses here in First and Second Corinthians. Maybe your mind has run to Second Corinthians chapter 5 because this also ties in with this broad concept of stewardship. And again, why I thought it was important to do this is because if we isolate that single descriptor for what we've called to be steward, it's powerful, but we don't catch that whole range of meanings that we sometimes appreciate when we see some of the other adjectives that are used to describe believers. So let's look here. This is actually a noun. We're called to be in first in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 20 and 21. Paul, speaking of his own calling, of which we are to emulate, 2 Corinthians 5, beginning with verse 20, now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be ye reconciled to God. For he made him, Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. What's the calling here? 
ambassadors, representatives of the highest order, representing a dignitary, a foreign nation, a foreign ruler. We here are on planet Earth, foreign territory. We're not in heaven, and we are called as what? Stewards and ambassadors, called as ministers, called as kings and priests. The descriptors could go on and on. That doesn't mean that we're all called to full-time gospel ministry, but it means that every one of us are called as stewards to represent the king. So that's what a steward does. That's what a steward is. That's some of the, the picture that these descriptive words give us. So that tells us some about the marks of a steward, right? We are representing the king of kings. We are representing that brand of Christianity, whether you like that analogy or not. But there are certain characteristics that make, an, make a steward an effective one. 1 Corinthians 4 said one key characteristic is faithfulness faithfulness. Let's go to the dictionary for a minute and catch this concept. What does it mean to be faithful? First definition, loyal, constant, and steadfast. Can refer to of a spouse or partner, never having a sexual relationship with any other. It can refer to an object, a faithful object, an object that is reliable. Second definition, true to the facts or the original, a faithful copy of something. Another definition of faithful is firm in adherence to promises or in observance of duty. Faithful. And actually, the dictionary tells us it's an obsolete definition, but it really hints at the origin of the word. Faithful literally means full of faith. Full of faith. Here's what I'd like to suggest to you as we look at the marks of a steward. As we look at everything presented in this week's lesson, the only way to be a steward and effectively represent the king of kings is to have that characteristic of being full of faith. What do you think? I mean, look at, look at, the, look at the lesson descriptors. Faithfulness, in fact, we saw, and we'll look a little bit more momentarily at uh, Monday's descriptor, that's loyalty. Faithfulness and loyalty, essentially synonymous, at least one aspect of faithfulness is being loyal. How about a clear conscience on Tuesday? What gives us a clear conscience? Being faithful, right? How about obedience? Well, we heard that in the definitions of faithfulness, right? Being obedient, being faithful, being, being uh, holding your allegiance. What about trustworthiness? Really, all of these descriptors, aren't they aspects of being faithful? So this sets what we might say a very high bar because you can say, well, who has that kind of faith? Turn in your Bibles to Romans. We're going to look at Romans chapter 12. And in Romans chapter 12, we read something that's encouraging to me. Romans chapter 12, hopefully it's encouraging to you too because sometimes we look in the mirror and we feel like our faith isn't all that great. But Romans 12 reminds us of a great truth. Romans 12, verse 3, and it's quite interesting because here Paul is uh, getting ready to speak about the Christian church, this unified church that has different roles. It's one of those descriptions of the church as a body. But as he's beginning this description in Romans 12, verse 3, he says this, For I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to everyone a measure of faith. So you might say, I just don't have faith. But you do have faith. The Bible says every one of us is given what? A measure of faith. 
So here's the question. How do you grow faith? How do you grow faith? Faith grows like anything else. Well, I'll tell you about one of my patients. I can tell you about several of my patients. I've got a number of patients who have had the unfortunate experience of having had a stroke. And so the stroke destroyed a part of their brain. And I'm thinking of some patients whose brains were destroyed in regions that controlled the movement on one side of their body. So you come in, you see one of those patients with me. If you were in the office and you'd see a normal arm perhaps on the left and you look at the right arm that has been afflicted with the stroke maybe five, six years ago and you look at that arm and what's different about the stroke affected arm than the arm that is wholly sound. What's different? That's right. That arm that doesn't have the brain nerve supply has not been moving, okay? They've not been able to use that arm. And as a result, that arm has atrophied. Troph refers to grow. A means without or lack of. So there's lack of growth. It's atrophic. The muscles have wasted away. Why has their arm not gotten stronger or why has it not even maintained its strength? What's the problem? That's right, they've not been using their arm. The arm was not getting messages from the brain and it wasn't being used. Well, let's follow the illustration out. If as Christians we're ambassadors and stewards, we're taking care of someone else's goods, we're representing someone else, who is that? That's Jesus. And so if we have a connection with Jesus, what does he tell us to do with our faith? To use it, right? To exercise it. Now, for how many of you did it take much faith to come to church today? I mean, some of you it may have. Others of you are smiling. Oh, well, it didn't take much faith for me to come to church. You know, I just jumped in the car. And, well, for some of you, it might have taken a lot of faith. Maybe you have a car that is very unreliable, okay, and a long drive. And you were just praying, Lord, please help this to be the one day this week that the car gets to its destination without breaking down, right? So you had a journey of faith. I had a friend who I forget what he said his car ran on. He, it either ran on grace or faith. I think it was actually both, right? So think about it, though. How many of you like to be in situations where you have to exercise faith? I mean, usually, we would prefer things just to go smoothly, right? We, but God puts us in situations where we have to exercise faith. We have to trust him. We have to move out in faith. The quarterly gives uh, perhaps one of the great examples of faith. It is one of the Bible's crowning examples, and it refers us to not only Hebrews, but also Romans. And uh, let's just turn there to Hebrews 11. You know that Hebrews 11 is often referred to as what? That's right, the faith chapter or the hall of faith. The hall of faith there in Hebrews 11. We read there about champions of faith, some of whom did not seem all that faithful at times. I don't know, we often don't sometimes mention that part of the story. But in Hebrews 11, we're gonna go to verse eight because in verse eight, we bring in sharp focus Perhaps the person who is identified for faith, and yet this individual was not always, again, an emblem of faithfulness. Hebrews 11, beginning with verse 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place where he would receive an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. I mean, I, I love this picture. And we were talking, some of us, not long ago about this. Can you imagine you're packing the moving truck in front of your house? The moving truck is all packed. And one of your neighbors says, I didn't know you were leaving. It was a hasty packing job. They say, where are you going? I don't know. I don't know. How would that feel? Abraham left prosperity. That's what the historical record, the archaeological record shows us. Ur of the Chaldees, a, uh, one of the chief cities of its day. They found 
opulent gold artifacts from Ur. I mean, beautifully crafted. I mean, this was the place to live. I don't know what the place to live is in the eyes of the average person in the world. Maybe it's London or Paris or New York, San Francisco. I don't know. It's some great city. You're living in an ideal circumstance. You say, but Dr. DeRose, I don't like cities. Whatever the circumstance is, it was the place to live, and Abraham is told by God to do what? To leave. Now, it's fine to leave, but you just want to know where you're going, right? I mean, you're okay, right? You're okay with moving for God, aren't you? You're willing to go somewhere where it's not comfortable, but are you willing to go not knowing where you're going? I mean, it's not really respectable, is it? I mean, could you imagine if one of our pastors said, I have an announcement to make. The Lord has called me to leave. He's got a different ministry. Well, where are you going? I don't know. We say, well, I mean, that's, in, in ministry, I mean, that's just faithfulness. Maybe you would be inspired by such a pastor. But most people are not impressed by those who are exercising such faith as Abraham. But you know, Abraham's story doesn't end there. And if we were to look at all the scriptures, we would be reminded We'd be reminded of other aspects of the faith of Abraham, right? How about the sacrifice of his own son? I mean, have you ever thought about that? That experience on Mount Moriah. Abraham getting the message to go and to sacrifice his son of promise. Look in Hebrews, it mentions that very story. And uh, go with me there in Hebrews chapter 11 again to verse 17. It's amazing, the faith of Abraham, when you think about it. By faith, Abraham, Hebrews 11, 17, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, in Isaac, your seed shall be called. Concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. Do you realize what the scripture is telling us here? Abraham knew at this point, I mean, even though he wavered, his faith wavered, didn't it? But here when it comes to the sacrifice of Isaac, he knows God has called his son, Isaac, to be the heir. And now God, he knows, he knows God's voice. God is calling them to sacrifice his son. He says, look it, I don't know how this works. All I know is God's telling me to sacrifice my son and he's the heir of promise. I believe that if God's calling me to kill my son, he could raise him from the dead. I mean, is that not remarkable? So God is asking for us as stewards to have this characteristic of faithfulness. And we look at Abraham and we say, I mean, how can we? How can we have the faith of Abraham? We've all been given the measure of faith And God gives us opportunities to exercise it. And we exercise faith when we follow God's will, especially when it conflicts with our desires. Right? If you're just doing what your own common sense would tell you to do, if you say, well, anybody would do that, that doesn't take faith. Hebrews doesn't end with chapter 11. And lest we get so focused on things that seem awfully stern, like rightly representing the king and being ambassadors and living a life of faithfulness, let's look at really what all this is supposed to point the world to. Chapter 12 of Hebrews, it points us to Jesus. Points us to Jesus. Let's look there. Hebrews 12, speaking of this great cloud of witnesses, not that they're somehow cheering us on from heaven. Most all these individuals are sleeping in the grave to this day, according to the Bible. But in chapter 12, it says we are surrounded by these great witnesses. Just like the Bible said, even though Abel was dead, his witness was still speaking. Are you following along? So these witnesses in Hebrews 11 are still speaking to us. And what are they calling us to do? Listen, Hebrews 12, no, 
You there? Hebrews 12, verses 1 and onward. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Th doesn't this bring it back into focus for us? Doesn't it? Think about it. We've been called to, to have faith, right? But here, Jesus is what? He's the author and what? The finisher of our faith. So the Holy Spirit gives every one of us a measure of faith, and as we exercise that faith, looking to Jesus, what happens? That faith grows, and Jesus is committed not only to give us that measure of faith, to but to bring our faith to completion. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. And do you catch what Jesus was doing as he looked to the cross? He wasn't looking at the shame of the cross. As he looked at that calling that he had, what was he looking at? He was, was looking at the joy set before him. Remember Lois and her husband? What did they see when they looked across the street at that Seventh-day Adventist church? They saw joyful, happy people. And sometimes I just scratch my head. Jesus was a man of sorrows, right? He was acquainted with grief. But what was it like to be in the presence of Jesus? It was joy to be in Jesus' presence. I mean, who ran to Jesus? Little children. I mean, little children don't run to the grumpiest person in the group. They don't. It was joy to be in Jesus' presence. So how he had the joy of heaven in his heart but he was still burdened with the sins of the world. We're called to be his ambassadors, his stewards. We're called to have the faith of Jesus in the midst of a world that is crashing and burning. Well, loyalty, a clear conscience. Let's go to that clear conscience because, um, you know, we, we, we're observed already that all of these are aspects of faith. If I'm living a faithful life, I have a clear conscience, right? Before God, if I'm trusting him, if I'm walking with him, but here's the problem. How many of us have lived a perfect Christian life? How many of us have walked a perfect walk? How many of us have fallen? Well, the Bible says all have sinned, right? All have come short of the glory of God. Only Jesus, right, was tempted in all points without sinning. So what hope do we have then? Let's look, we're in Hebrews. We've been looking a lot at Hebrews. Hebrews 10 has some very uh, sober s statements. We'll look there because Hebrews has this balance of encouragement and things that uh, bring us a greater measure of sobriety. Hebrews 10, beginning with verse 19. Hebrews 10 beginning with verse 19. It says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest, the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So just as there's sobering passages in Hebrews about the danger of turning away from Christ, there are these pictures of Jesus as our high priest that we can come to. We'll go back to Hebrews 4 for another picture, another word picture of this privilege we have. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. Again, this imagery of Jesus as our high priest in heaven. Seeing then that we have what? A great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us do what? Hold fast our confession. We could say hold fast our faith. Hold fast our call as stewards. 
For we don't have a high priest who can't sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You know, the invitation's there for each one of us. We can come to Jesus boldly. We don't have to be afraid of, of what's in our past. We can come right to Jesus right now. He wants to equip us and fit us to be loyal stewards, to be obedient and faithful stewards. But you know, it's still a struggle. I know many times, and I've, I've dealt with it myself, we look at our own past and we say, how can God forgive me? Some of you might be here today or you might be viewing and you haven't fully connected with the Lord's people. You haven't been baptized with Bible baptism. You have not come into to God's fold fully because you don't feel worthy. Turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 19. I think one of the great stories, because remember, we can have a clear conscience as we're faithful, but if we look at our past, we often see that our conscience is marred and sometimes we can fear to take God at his word when he tells us to come, when Jesus says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Jesus says, I won't cast you out. Whoever comes to me, I'll in no wise cast you out. Luke 19, I love this story. It's one of these great stories because it teaches us something powerful about a clear conscience. It's the story of Zacchaeus. You know the story, right? Zacchaeus, chief tax collector, a Jew, hated by his own people because he was in collusion with the Romans. Tax collection was uh, synonymous with extortion because the tax collectors lined their pockets when they could extort more money from the tax collectees, if you will. That's Zacchaeus. But what picture do we get of Zacchaeus when Jesus comes to Jericho. He's climbing up a tree to see Jesus. Now I want you to think about this. He was likely one of the wealthiest men in that area. How surprised would you be to see a wealthy New York businessman at the Thanksgiving Day Parade shimmying up a light post to get a better view of the parade, what would you think? I mean, think, I mean, come on. I mean, a little kid might do that, right? Zacchaeus humbled himself because he was so focused on what? Looking unto Jesus, right? Now, what's remarkable about the story as it relates to conscience, Jesus looks up he tells Zacchaeus he's already made an appointment at his home, but it doesn't stop there. As the crowd begins to grumble, Zacchaeus, sinner, Jesus going to eat with this guy, going to his house? Zacchaeus makes a statement in verse 8. Look, Lord, I give half my goods to the poor, and if I've taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. Now listen what Jesus says, verse 9. Today, salvation has come to this house because he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Here's the question. Has Zacchaeus made everything right in Luke 19? He's not. There's still a lot of baggage in his life that he hasn't fully accounted for yet, but what has he decided? He's decided to follow Jesus. You see, you don't have to wait till everything's cleaned up in your life to come to Jesus. You don't have to wait till everything is perfect. Jesus asks you to come as you are. Yes, he wants us to repent. He wants us to make things right in the past. But you know, some of us have so much baggage that we would never come to Jesus, right? If we just looked at our past. I was brought back into the past, not my own past but the past in the state of Arizona just last week. I was speaking at a small church. 
the Benson Church outside of Tucson. And some of the gracious church members decided to take me to one of the local sites. I there learned about a couple of gentlemen. Gary Tenens and Randy Tufts. A couple of amateur spelunkers, cave explorers, back in the 70s, students at the University of Arizona. They had heard rumors that somewhere outside of Benson there was a cave. In fact, Randy had been out there some seven years before, and this is now back in 1974. These two individuals go to this location. There's a sinkhole there in the middle of some vast ranch lands. Nobody's around, nobody's looking. It's private property, but I mean, who's going to know when you've got acres and acres of cattle ranch land? And so these two guys go down and they look at a spot that Randy had seen some seven years before, heard there was a cave there, but it just didn't seem there was any way to get into it. But now it actually seemed like, I don't know if the ground had moved a little bit or maybe things had settled. And Gary and Randy thought that they could actually get through this small crevice. And they, they, they make their way in and they find about 100 feet of cave. It's obvious other people had been there before. There's footprints, there's broken structures, cave uh, structures, stalactites or stalagmites. They didn't go into detail about it. But um, what attracted them on this particular day is there was a warm, moist breeze coming out when they first arrived. And as they got into this 100 feet or so of rooms that had obviously been occupied before, they said there's too much, too much warm breeze coming out to actually just be coming from these two small rooms. And as they scouted around, they found another small passageway and they crawled for some eight feet or so and they came to a tiny three-inch hole. Warm, moist air coming out. What would you do? I'll tell you what I would probably have done. I probably would have left, okay? But that was not what these two guys were going to do. They had a small sledgehammer. Now, I don't have one of these in my uh, armamentarium at home, but it was a, a three-pound sledgehammer. We've got some sledgehammers. They're a lot bigger than that, but I guess they couldn't get anything larger in. And as I read through the story, in a, in a scientific journal I don't usually read, the story is actually found in the Journal of Cave and Karst Studies from back in 1999. They're, they're describing exactly what they did. They started hammering on this little hole until they opened up a hole big enough, big enough. Boy, it's kind of, it's amazing what they said. Okay, I'll read it to you because some of you, I can tell, want to know what they did at that point. It says, they laid in this crawl way for two hours, they widened that hole with a sledgehammer and a chisel, and it says finally they were able to squeeze through the hole. Ten and first, and then tufts, but only by taking off their belts and exhaling. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I think I would have uh, probably wanted a little wider than that. But as these guys continued their explorations that day and onward, they ended up finding what is called Karchner Caverns. And amazing caverns, as I, as I looked at that less than a week ago. Amazing cave structures. No one had ever been there before. It is an, it's a living cave. And what struck me about the whole story is listen to the description of the, the finders of this cave. Here's what they said. Since we discovered the cave in 1974, all our efforts have been for the purpose of protecting the cave for posterity. They saw themselves as stewards of the cave. 
And they tell the whole story there of how they worked with the state legislature, trying to keep everything secret the whole time, uh, blindfolding state officials, driving them and you know, circuitous routes to bring them to the cave. Um, amazing story. But now there's this amazing cave. And the state has spent some, they told me, $38 million to this point developing this cave, blasting, uh, blasting up until they got too, you know, so close that you couldn't safely blast without damaging the cave structures, but blasting through large amounts. And, and in order to go into this living cave, they had to take us through barrier after barrier. It's like you're entering some kind of a, a clean room in a semiconductor factory or, or going into uh, some carefully guarded prison. I used to... Uh, uh, spend a little bit of time in a state mental facility when I was doing my preventive medicine training and we had to go through these different doors and, and all these safeguards and that's what it was. They're controlling the humidity. The cave is a living cave. Now here's my point and I think there's some interesting il illustrations. First of all, what drew them into the cave was what? This warm wind. And in the Bible we often speak about a wind being what? The Holy Spirit, right? Now you might say, oh, Dr. DeRose, you're taking some liberties here with the, with the account. But really, they, they were drawn into something that was an incredible treasure, but it wasn't visible. I mean, isn't that really what Christianity is? It's a great treasure that God's entrusted to us. I mean, the Bible uses the same illustrations of a buried treasure, right? Where a man would sell everything to have the field? I guess these guys couldn't buy all the acres that the Karchners owned. It, the Karchners actually owned that land. That's what the caverns are named after. Now it's a state park. But, um, and what, what did they see their privilege as? It was a joy and privilege to, to enjoy this amazing cave, but they didn't want it just for themselves. But they wanted to preserve it. They saw themselves as stewards, and they were obedient to the trust that was committed to them. You know, some of you may have scratched your head in Thursday's lesson where it speaks about trustworthiness. I'll just talk about a couple of people who are trustworthy because the scripture focus there is on the parable of the steward in Luke 16. We won't read that, that whole parable there, but it is one of the more difficult parables because this is a steward who's not being faithful. And when his unfaithfulness is discovered by the master, what does he say? He says, well, listen, I can't do manual labor. I can't dig. I, I'm ashamed to beg. I'm not going to be a, you know, a pauper begging. So what does he do? He actually starts trading on the master's goods, but not in an honest way, in a dishonest way. He starts lowering the indebtedness of all the debtors to his master. You remember the story, right? Someone owes, you know, 100 pounds of something. Well, you know, make it 50. And what did the master in that story do? He commended that unjust steward. Now, the master there is not Jesus. It's a worldly master who's commending a worldly steward for being shrewd in a difficult position. But his shrewdness was in taking the goods of the master and sharing them with other people. Isn't that an amazing insight into stewardship? Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting to me. Luke 16 is also where you have that parable of the rich man and Lazarus. And, and most Christians will not say they'd be happy with a church treasurer who was uh, skimming the books and uh, cheating the church, right? But they want to take the parable of the rich man and Lazarus very literally. I mean, you can't do it with either one. They're parables, okay, to teach a lesson. And the lesson is God has made us stewards of his goods and we're to take those goods and do what? To share them with others. Are we hoarding them to ourselves? You know, when I read Tenen and Tuff's account of their finding of Karchner Caverns, they wanted to keep those caves a secret to themselves. They did for a number of years, several years. But they realized that was not a way to be stewards of that great treasure. They had to give away what they were given. And I think uh, uh, their faith in the whole process increased. They had a lot of doubts about uh, what the state would do and how things would work out. 
but now thousands of people seeing something of beauty that they were entrusted as stewards with. Well, there's a lot more we'll be talking about in this quarter about stewardship. We've also got a free resource for you. It's called In God We Trust. You can get it free if you're in the US, North America, by calling 866-STUDY-MORE. I invite you all to be back with us next week as we continue our study on stewardship, motives of the heart. We'll look forward to seeing you then. Have you ever heard the expression before, they eat like a bird, talking about somebody that has a minuscule appetite? Well, you might want to think twice next time you use that expression. For example, take the hummingbird. In order for it to maintain its incredible metabolism, it has to eat about 50% of its body weight every day. To put that in perspective, if a 100-pound woman was to eat like a hummingbird, she would have to eat 50 pounds of sugar a day just to maintain her body weight. Imagine that. Maybe you don't want to imagine that. Or perhaps we want to consider this another way. The hummingbird typically consumes between four to seven calories a day. On the other hand, a human, about 3,500 calories a day. But if you were to eat like a bird, a hummingbird, you'd have to eat over 150,000 calories a day. But that's like a man, 170 pounds, that would be eating 3,000 Oreo cookies. Under normal conditions, a hummingbird needs to eat every five or 10 minutes. But there's actually one time during the year the hummingbird will eat its entire body weight every day. You see, once a year, they make this migration of 500 miles across the Gulf of Mexico, from Texas to the Yucatan Peninsula. In order to do that, the hummingbird feasts on nectar and gorges themselves on this nectar for about a week, doubling their body weight. That's the only way they can store enough calories to help them with their 70 wing beats per second, or roughly 4 million wing beats on that journey. You know, in the same way, friends, as we near the end of time, we need to be feasting and gorging ourselves on the nectar of God's Word. We've got to be able to have that strength to get us through the times of trouble that are ahead. So when it comes to the Bible and your personal devotions, if you're going to eat like a bird, eat like a hummingbird.